So let's look at preparing. Now preparing was broken down into two sub-elements, targeting and commissioning, that's the where and the who, and then understanding and strategizing, that's the people we're going to reach, understanding them and understanding the community. So here are some of the tasks that would be going on. Defining the vision, defining the model. Remember, we had that list of different models of pioneer church planning and reproduction. Determining the location, the ministry focus people. Selecting the leader. We talked about church planner assessment, remember? Uh, who are going to be the team members? Remember we said that a team is better than an individual. Consulting with others, getting information, talking with people who live in that location, um, securing prayer and financial support. We don't want to launch a church plant without prayer and a support team. And then commissioning. We found it so important for that team, uh, whether they're being sent out from a mother church or whether it's going to be for a new pioneer work, that, that they're brought before, like in Acts 13, with the laying on of hands and the commissioning and say, we are sending you out in the name of Christ for this church plant to reach people for Jesus. That is so inspiring and, and, and instills a sense of confidence in that team and in the team leaders. And uh, most of the churches that I've been involved planning have had that commissioning where a church sends us out with their blessing, with their prayers, and the sense that the Holy Spirit has sent us out. This is not just something we thought up. God is in this, and we have that support and that confidence. And the role there, as we mentioned, of the church planner is team builder, bringing that team and that vision together. Now, as you move into saying, okay, now let's come to understand the people, that may mean learning the language and the culture. If that's not a language I know, if that's not a culture I'm very familiar with, that's going to be my very first step. But then even researching the context. Don't assume you know the context that well. You say, well, you know, I'm a Russian and I work in Russia. I don't have to, to uh, learn the language or anything. But working in Siberia in a rural area would be very, very different than working in Moscow in an urban area. You need to adapt to the locality. What are the unique features of life in that town or in that location? What are some of the real needs that people have and what are some of the felt needs they have? They may not sense they have spiritual needs, but they have other needs. I mentioned uh, the example of, of uh, potty training in one place where they found out that people had a need to, to, to learn family dynamics. Maybe there's a need for marriage uh, counseling. Maybe there's a need for, for, um, for children's work. We'll talk about some of this when we talk about evangelism, but learning how to connect with people's needs. Maybe people have a need to learn English. A lot has been done with, with English camps and English teaching, and that's a way to build relationships. Um, anticipating obstacles. What might be some stumbling blocks that we run into? Maybe they view our particular approach to being Christians as a sect, as some sort of a weird cult that's dangerous. How are we going to answer to that? We're going to have to anticipate spiritual opposition. What might other religious leaders think? And how will we deal with that? Building relationships. Um, who are people on location in that place that we need to know? I used to always go and, and try and uh, meet the other religious leaders. I would try and, uh, if, if it was a smaller location, meet the local mayor or meet the local political leaders. And it was really helpful to have a local person who could kind of say, here's a person you need to know. And by doing that, we were able to uh, avoid misunderstanding. You know, local leaders don't like surprises. They like to know what's going on in their community. And they don't want to have somebody come up to them and say, hey, there's this new church thing going on over there. What's that all about? See, a local leader doesn't like to be surprised and stand there and say, I don't know. Hey, he's supposed to know what's going on, right? So I would like to go to the local leader and say, hey, this is who we are. This is what we're doing. Here's maybe some literature or something about what our concerns are. Determining the evangelistic strategy. Uh, we'll talk more about evangelism later. And then strengthening that team, clarifying the roles. If different people on that team have different gifts and so on. And then many times... 
uh, it's good to draft actually a written proposal for that church plant. That won't be necessary everywhere, but many times having a written proposal helps everybody know at least initially what your plan is, and it can help in recruiting others who will be supporters of that plan, whether they're financial supporters or churches that will be praying for you. Uh, and so here the role of the church planner is to be a learner. Don't assume too much. This is the biggest mistake at this point. People say, well, I, you know, I kind of know what that's all about in that community. Um, but they don't, and they assume too much. And they end up making unnecessary mistakes. They may unnecessarily offend people. Um, and then you have to undo all of that. I think of churches that went in and, uh, in one community in Germany, well, more than one community actually, where the new church was started, and then the newspapers gave a report, new sect in town. It was in the newspaper. And it was like, oh no. And now we've got to somehow try and undo this. So they go to the newspaper. Well, then in the small print somewhere, you know, a few days later, there appears, well, actually, this is not a sect. They're, you know, a recognized church. Of course, nobody read that. They read the headline that said new sect was in town. Well, if they'd probably spoken with the newspaper in advance and given them good information in advance, they would have had positive press. Maybe the newspaper would have printed something very positive. We've had that happen, too. But they're just mistakes that are unnecessary. So be a learner and uh, do your homework in this phase. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS Seminary's database, please visit tvsseminary.com. There's a city on the outskirts of Kursk where I worked uh, for some time. Uh, there's a church there, and uh, the pastor is very actively um, trying to find members for this church. He's uh, also trying to uh, build more churches in uh, the city. Uh, but uh, the population uh, is uh, uh, pretty small, and a large part of it are uh, gypsies. Uh, we all know that uh, there's a certain uh, maybe fear of gypsies. Um, uh, so uh, my question is, uh, what uh, do you do when you have these uh, ethnic uh, relations? Uh, and do you create a new service or a different service? Or do you um, convince uh, the citizens that it's okay or what's going on? <laughs> Well, this is a question that church planners and missionaries have been asking for a long time. And there's sort of a technical term for this that uh, old people from the church growth movement called the homogeneous unit principle, which basically said people like to go to churches where other people are, are like them. I like to be with people who are like me. And that's a human characteristic. It's true. And so what you're describing is you say, well, you have a church and the majority of people there are Gypsy, Sinti or Roma, and um, they have a certain character. They have a certain way they like to be with one another. And uh, then you've got other people who may not feel comfortable with them. Now, the, so the question is, do you just try and integrate people into that existing church and say, well, we'll make this church friendlier for those other people uh, so somehow they do feel welcome? Or do you say, start a second church that they just feel comfortable in, and then you really have two churches? So this is a debate that's been going on. Uh, some people have theologically criticized that approach because they say, well, wait a minute. In the New Testament, you didn't have a church for Jews and a church for Gentiles, but we're one in Christ. It needs to demonstrate the unity and that, that the power of Christ is to break down these human barriers and to show that unity. And so there's many strong advocates of the multi-ethnic church where we bring together especially people who are from different ethnic backgrounds or have different uh, stylistic uh, things that, that, that might separate them. And I think the answer is probably a little bit of, of both and. Um, on the one hand, we have to remember, I cannot expect a non-Christian to act like a Christian. Now, I could maybe ask a Christian to say, please come to this church because, and be willing to relate to people who are different from you because they're your brothers and sisters in Christ. A Christian should be able to understand that, and that's part of being mature in Christ, to say, I have brothers and sisters who are different, and whether they're gypsies or whether they're, they're a different ethnic group or have a different skin color, they're my brothers and sisters. I should be able to worship with them. But I cannot expect a non-Christian to do that. 
And if he finds a people offensive, he has to really become a Christian first to be willing to embrace those people who maybe he found offensive or dangerous or somehow too different. And so I think the more evangelistic we're working, the more we need to approach those people on their terms, in their culture, and in a way that's not going to force them to do something that, that goes against their, their inner self. But as they embrace Jesus Christ and experience the power of Christ to love people who they might not have loved before, then I think we need to try and combine those groups. And so the more evangelistic, the more I need to respect some of those concerns. The more those people are growing in Christ, the more we need to overcome those barriers. Unfortunately, especially with certain groups like, like uh, gypsy groups, it's the other way, where the existing church is not the gypsy group. But we've found, especially in Eastern Europe, many times the gypsy peoples are more open to the gospel, but those existing churches don't want to receive them. Uh, or the gypsy attends that church and they feel that the other people you know, are not accepting them. And then sometimes, unfortunately, by necessity, we say, no, we'll have to start a church for the gypsies because they're just not being accepted. I think that's a poor witness to the love of Christ and the body of Christ, but it's a reality. And sometimes, unfortunately, we have to deal with the realities um, and uh, they may not be the ideal situation, but for the sake of reaching those people for Christ, we may have to start a separate church for them. So there's a tension there.